In Depth with Larry Flick on Sirius XM. First thing I say to Ron Perlman is, how you doing? How you doing? And you say, you're, you're, you're holding on to life. <laughs> That's right. As best you can. That's what we're all doing. And uh, it's funny because I just, and I mean just, finished watching your movie. Asher? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Just so finished much. watching it. I like to watch movies as close to an interview as I can because that allows me to kind of still be in the world of the movie right before I talk to someone. That is so cool. And uh and it's a it's a it's not a, a luxury I have very often, but it's it's one I had today. So, I really enjoyed this movie. Thank you so much. I feel very blessed that you were able to 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 uh to do that. Oh, you're very kind. So well, well timed. It's a really good part of my job is to watch a movie. You yeah. Know? Uh, and they paid you. me for it too. Yeah. Um but but you know you, you you made that joke and but at the same time I walked away from the movie thinking about youth and the time we have left and because right. that's kind of what this movie's about. Yeah, I mean it's 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 in a way it's like the the classic aging gunslinger, you know, who at one point was, you know, the go to like the 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 number one. Yeah. You know, the the the. Um, the Jedi, and uh, he's he's dealing with the fact that um, his best years are behind him, and he's he's in a reality where uh, there's no graceful way to leave a legacy or to or to fade away into obscurity. Uh, it's uh, you know it's pretty black and white in in his world, uh, and um, so he's become disposable. Um, or he's beginning to feel like he's becoming disposable while he's living in this neighborhood in Brooklyn, which is also becoming disposable because it's being gentrified and, and you know, turned on its ear. All of this phenomenal ambiance that, you know, he knew as his home for decades and decades is now, you know, um, art galleries and coffee houses and... and internet shops and stuff and, and just millennials everywhere you look it's sickening it's funny because as i watched the movie it was so apparent to me that you could watch this movie on two levels you could watch it and you can enjoy you know the the action because there is a fair amount of it in this movie mm -hmm. but if you really pay attention to this movie that's just metaphor for what a lot of us, well, really what we're all going through, but some of us more than others, which is, you know, the the sand is shifting under our feet mm -hmm. and we have to cede some of the land to the youth, but how you do it, when you do it, and uh, all of that is the part that's really hard, you know. The thing I liked most about Asher is that he still has his swagger, he still has his skill, but he doesn't really necessarily want it anymore. He doesn't know if he wants it anymore. He's kind of really at odds with it, which is something that I, just as a person, as a man, am finding myself dealing with mm -hmm. in my in my life. So I was watching it and I'm just thinking, yep. <laughs> I just, you know, it was a very complicated and triggering kind of experience for me mm -hmm. to just watch it i feel yeah, and um what attracted me to the style of the film was the minimalism of it all how much is said with such minor dialogue and minor gestures but it, it's clear that this is a guy who in order to execute the you know the career that he's chosen for himself, the skill set that he's he's been handed down by being a very elite kind of Mossad trained Israeli killer, that uh, he's also taken on um, some life choices, which are now becoming um, now now that he's reached a point in a man's life where one begins to think of. What am I leaving behind? So the, the, he's he's naturally, and, and I know this because I'm at that age where 
most of my obsession is about legacy, is about like, you know, um, I, I no longer have any real ambitions because everything has either been satiated or no longer applies. But I do have a concern uh, of, you know, was it all worthwhile? Am I leaving anything behind of, you know, is, is, is the earth a better or a worse place for my having been in it? You know, legacy, real legacy questions. And when you've uh, taken on all of the choices that Asher has had to take on, you know, the, the, the implied assumption that he could never have a woman in his life because anybody who comes into his life is, is in danger, physical danger. So that's a choice. And then the the coincidental uh, appearance of a woman in his life in this yeah. story um, triggers all of this. My God, like, um, do I deserve better than what I, you know, thought I did? Do I need more than what I settled for when I made the bargain with the devil, you know, forty years ago? And all of all of those things play out in, in on the screen, but in incredibly unexplained minimalist way it's a really it's it's you you find yourself negotiating i found myself as i was watching it just now negotiating with myself in how i felt about him how i felt about what he was making me think about myself um how old are you 68 68 i'm 55 and so i'm somewhere between trying to prove i've still got it and and legacy, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm, I'm I'm in a business that's very quick to try to replace me with people who are younger and cheaper. Mm -hmm. They all are, right? And 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 you know, I'm 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 watching I'm watching what's happening on on the screen as I'm looking at the movie, and I'm thinking, isn't there a way that he can have it have have it all? Mm -hmm. Because there's a still just a tiny part of me that wants to believe that you can still have it all. Even though there are days when I walk around and I go, yep, won't do that. That opportunity is passed. We'll never try that. Like you just have a checklist, right? Mm -hmm. Some people have their bucket list of things they want to do. Mm -hmm. I have one of those, but I also have that list of things I just know I'm not going to get to. Right. Me too. It's a weird list to make. And I can tell you something very sobering, my friend. Tell me. 55 and 68 are really different. I know they are. I know because they are. I, I, you know, from 50 to 60 was my strongest decade even really? physically i was i was it's just felt in in a constant state of well-being that whole decade almost to the point where i thought i was going to beat the reaper i was going to be that one guy that lived forever and really and never and never lost his you know why one, i don't know i just just felt great in my 50s and also there was this this um um, maturing, you know, in a way where I, I was more patient than I had ever been before, where I was more sanguine about how I can trust in the universe and things would, would, would happen without me having to constantly be manipulating and, and navigating and jerry-rigging. Um, it was an incredible, and, and great things came my way in my 50s that, you know, I did an amazing, uh, series of artistic things which mean a great deal to me as 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 a human so it was it was just this blessed and then the minute i hit 60 man yeah um you know <laughs> even even the act of finishing tying my shoes and then sitting back up again you know and having all the blood <laughs> the blood <laughs> but, but 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 in terms of I don't want to bum you out. You're not bumming me out. But in terms of what we were just discussing, the legacy thing, yeah. that really begins to kick in. And I wrote a memoir, which was a happenstance. Like I remember right, that book. Right, right when I right, right when I turned sixty, and I can tell you and your listening audience, when you turn sixty, you should write a memoir, whether you're planning on publishing it or not, because it's the most amazing act of self reflection. And of having to 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 lift yourself up to thirty five thousand feet and look down in an objectified way of like what whether your life had any real direction or whether whether there were any patterns there that you wish you had knew earlier 
you know, it's 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 an opportunity to um, to segue into this this period of of thinking about these legacy issues. And legacy is, um, you know, now that I'm at that point in my life, it's it's as powerful a period in a man's life as it gets. You know, um, and there's lots of powerful periods in a man's life in in the maturation process anyway. But this is as compelling as any that I've ever lived through. It's absolutely fascinating, and I and I 100% believe you, and I'm not bummed out by it because there's a part of me that, like I said, I'm kind of somewhere between a line of constant reevaluation. Sometimes I think it's because of the work I do, and still feeling like I've got something to say because I'm actually doing my best work right now. Uh, yeah, you know, like I never felt more in touch with who and what I want to be and what I can com accomplish right now as I'm fighting harder now than when I was in my 20s. Because when you're in your 20s, you're fighting to get in. And I'm finding that in my 50s, I'm fighting to stay in. Mm -hmm. Because in my industry, they, you know, they're looking to replace me with somebody who's literally 20 years younger than mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. So when I'm watching this movie, I'm thinking all of these things. I'm thinking about all of it. Wow. And I'm and I'm watching watching you on the screen, and I'm thinking, what's going through his head as he's playing these these beats? Is it because of what you've just told me? Is it a harder character to unpack? Well, it's 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 one of the great pleasures of of the the, the exercise of being an actor. Is that you? Every once in a while, not always, because you know you, it's it's a commercial venture, so you're constantly taking jobs that are just jobs. But in the case of Asher, which is a movie that was the first movie my my burgeoning little film studio optioned, so it's it was it was one of the it's as old as the studio is, which is about six years now. It took six years to get the film to where you saw it today, but it's. It was essential that I that I that I get it done. I, I actually walked through fire to finish it. I mean, you know, there was a lot of bankruptcies and a lot of like people who I loved that I no longer speak to. A lot of dues were paid, but it was an opportunity to to as an artist be in a, a valedictory kind of a position where you say this is so personal. This is such an opportunity to 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 connect all of the dots. You know, a guy who at one point was um, untouchable. There was nobody else you wanted for the job. That's how vital he was. Who's now um, can no longer depend on those skill sets anymore. And he's watching them slip through his fingers while he can no longer. He he. There's no way he can signal the world that he's getting older he has to you know act as if he's still the man he used to be but he knows that his best days are behind him and you know the road he's on now is all downhill and that's me i mean that that was an opportunity for me to to to, to walk in my own shoes in a way you know and metaphorically explore you know uh, what i had been grappling with which is why I was so desperate to make the movie and to and to and to get it finished, whatever at whatever cost. So, what happens the day you know it's done? You know, I have um, reached a point now, through therapy and a lot of experience and a lot of ups and downs, where I have removed emotion almost from from this thing that I do. When the job is finished, uh, there's very, very little hoopla, there's very little transition, there's very little catharsis or anything like that. It's just, okay, what's next? And how long do I have to recharge my battery? And, and that's it. You know, it's a real kind of gunslinger mentality. But when, I, when we shot the last shot of Asher, it was the first time in 30 years where I really stopped and patted myself on the back and said, "Wow, you, I mean, you didn't leave anything in the in, in, in the locker room on this one. That was like, 
everything you needed to do to get that thing done, you did. And it felt like we had made the movie that I that 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 attracted me initially, which is this kind of seventies. What you were referring to earlier, I'm, I'm obsessed with the 70s as one of the great periods, last periods of American filmmaking because it gave way to Scorsese and Coppola and De Palma and, and Friedkin and, you know, I can go on and on and on, but it was, it was, you know, they were doing these genre films, but they were always character studies. They were always really human condition movies while they were being either thrillers or psychological dramas or comedies and and they were really you know exploring the flawed hero the 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 anti-hero and that's what asher was so when it came my way it was like this is an opportunity to do a a neo-noir you know real 70s kind of movie and it's just and then we ended up getting richard dreyfuss and jackie Bissett in the movie who were the the, the two emblematic stars of that period. Yeah, so, uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sy- synchronicity. You know, as I was watching the movie and seeing them in the movie and seeing you in this movie, because I, I I connect you with with the, this this world that you're talking about. Um, it feels very full circle in every once in a while I'll go back and watch some of those great movies from that, that period of time. This is my favorite era of filmmaking as mm-hmm. well. And I'll think, I wonder whatever happened to, whatever happened to, you have that, you know, what's what would happen if we ran into one of these guys or gals 20 years later, 30 years later? Mm. And I feel like this movie gives us a little bit of that satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Because this guy could have been the primary character in any one of those great seventies era mm-hmm. movies. Yeah. Uh, and and it's interesting because it really is sort of it's a study in it's a study in aging in a way that nobody's done yet. Right. right. It's a fascinating, fascinating, powerful movie. Thank you so much. I mean I I wasn't expecting this. I, was, I would thought I thought I'd, I'd be selling, selling the crap out of it, and here you are, uh, just um, um, saying things that I, I'm, I'm having to pinch myself. Oh, you're very kind. It's Ron Perlman joining us here in Sirius XM. The movie we're talking about is called Asher. Um, so, but I'm still trying to get. Okay, so where does the guy who's obsessed with legacy? And they, they, how does that guy emotionally move through the experience of watching this movie? Because you can't have a disconnect watching this movie. The movie doesn't allow it, mm-hmm. right? It kind of demands that you feel something. Mm-hmm. So how does the guy, yeah, how does the guy who is, who you, you've kind of painted this picture in my mind of a guy who hears time ticking in the back of his head mm-hmm. a lot of the day. Mm-hmm. How does that guy feel watching this movie? Boy, you tell me, I mean, you've already told me, you know, through, through, through. Well, your, that's through my experience. Through your experience. How is, what was your experience watching it? Well, can I'm, you watch I'm, it? Can you watch it and be like, this was this was one of the few times where I was able to watch something that I was in, yeah, that's so, and not cringe. So, um, you know, um, and I don't know why. I, maybe it's because it's it's. Um, I think it's the quietest performance I've ever given. It's the least. Uh, um, uh, dynamic performance I've ever given because the circumstances of the guy are. He's living in an incredibly dynamic reality, and in order for him to survive in that reality, he almost has to become invisible. He almost has to become unnoticeable. And it was the juxtaposition of those two things that um, I found interesting in the playing of it. In the watching of it, uh, the first time I ever saw the film finished with an audience was about a month ago at this film festival in, in Spain called Sitges, which is a beautiful film festival, um, about 
30 minutes outside of Barcelona. And, you know, you when you're watching something that you had a, a great hand in creating for the first time with a bunch of people who didn't had no idea what they were walking into, they're watching it completely like the great unwashed, like very objection, uh, 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 objectively. Um, you see really how it's playing. You see what they're experiencing. You can feel the audience feeling the movie. And so I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm able to answer your question personally because I'm, I'm like the chef who <laughs> spent the whole morning, you know, at, you know, at the fish market. You can't then, fully taste and it. And then spent the whole afternoon buying the vegetables and then spent the whole evening chopping and, and prepping and, you know, making the sauce so that by the time the thing is cooked, you know, he, he, he's nauseous, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not nauseous, but, but, but it's hard for me to enjoy the meal. Is it hard for you to enjoy the experience of other people watching it? Because when you, when you described that screening, my stomach clenched. I wouldn't, I don't think I would be able to live through it. Well, I've been obligated to sit through a lot of premieres of my movies because you have to, that's part of the press of it all. You have to show sure. up. Even if you, everything is yelling and screaming at you, get, get the hell out of here. Go, you know, go have a, Go go go! Smoke a, a bowl of crack, you know, in the, in the, in the alley with the, with the with the ticket guy, you know, and uh, or you know, pop open a can of Colt forty five, whatever you got to do to get through this. But you sit, you're forced to sit there. With Asher, um, I had all of the 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 the, the anxiety that I normally have of of you know not knowing how it was going to play not knowing what people were going to think of it, wondering whether I was going to love it as much as I did while we were editing it, while I was, you know, because I was, I was because I produced the film, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in every edit, every cut, every music cue, um, how long you stay on stuff, whether you keep something that you shot in there or whether you take it out, you know. And um, I'm praying that when I get to this objectified public screening, with a bunch of strangers that um, I'm able to have any kind of like, you know, uh, non-torturous experience 